Straw Hat Sam here. Uh, welcome to the Blackmagic Pocket 4K Naked Cage Assembly Tutorial. This is a long one, but I'm going to go through all the steps required to assemble this cage and all of its accessories, all the flex extensions, everything, including uh, how to make this professional looking extension cable, how to put together this naked monitor that's lightweight and fits in your backpack easily. Yeah, all of it. And this is a difficult project. Um, I would dedicate a full day to this and just walk through my tutorial step by step, take your time, make sure to take breaks often because this is a tricky procedure and it's simple but there are many steps and it's easy to get tired and fatigued. So make sure you're taking breaks often and paying close attention to my directions and following them. Now, uh, if you do destroy your camera during this process, even while uh, following my steps to the T, uh, I'm not responsible for that. It's your risk you're taking, it's your responsibility when undertaking this procedure. Uh, but I highly recommend doing it because it's going to change your life when it comes to cinematic FPV. The first thing we're going to do is prepare the PCB for all the little components that are going to be attached to it in the final product. The first thing I want to work on is this power port. This takes the 12 volt input from the regulator on board of your drone and it splits it out through this cable to power your Blackmagic camera and it also powers this fan which is used to cool the CPU. So let's go ahead and solder this up. The first component that you want to install to the power port is the uh, Pico EasyMate um, slim fitting thing. Now the middle two uh, circuits we aren't using so what you can do is just snip those right at the base. And the reason why I don't actually pull them out of their sockets is because the little clips that are left over, they help strengthen the uh, connection. Okay, so now we just have the uh, positive and the negative leads. The length that this comes with in the kit is about 50 millimeters long, and that's exactly what you want, so there's no need to trim. Next, use wire strippers to uh, remove the insulation on all four of these wires. And then um, put a little bit of uh, liquid flux on each of the uh, um, wires. However you like to do soldering, just do what you do, um, whatever you're, you're used to, and can make a good joint. And let's tin each and every single one of these. Don't keep the soldering iron long on the wire or else you'll melt this uh, PVC insulation. Okay, next preparing the uh, power port. Next is very important, the two wires, when the clip is facing this direction so that you can see more of the gold bits, not this direction, but this direction, this side right here on the right, this side, this is negative, and this is positive on the left. So positive, negative, positive, negative. <laughs> so um, take the corresponding wires and solder them to the uh, correct um, labeled vias on the circuit board. Okay, there's an ass load of flux left over, so let's scrape all that trash off and clean it up with some isopropyl alcohol. Next, let's prepare the fan. Um, first thing you want to do is unhook the wire from the little plastic tab uh, because the way it sits in the camera, you're going to want the wire to be uh, below the frame. And then from here, measure out 50 millimeters worth of wire and uh, measure it from the very corner of the square. So right about here. And slice that mamma jamma right off. 
And let's split these two wires apart and strip them. Okay, let's tin those bad boys. Or not tin, but flux them. Let's flux them up. Back to the power port, um, let's prepare these two pads here. Okay, and then add a little extra flux. And let's try to sink these right in, nice and clean. Okay, and the reason why I am installing all these wires on the top is because we want the bottom to be a nice flat smooth surface for the double sided mounting tape. Just going to give this a nice little scrub with a toothbrush with isopropyl alcohol. Okay, now to install the JST PH 2.0 uh, connector. Place it on top through the holes, then flip it over and clamp that in place. But keep a hold on the connector because it's going to want to fall out. And then uh, get some flux on there. Okay, and I'm going to reposition the clamp so I have more space with the soldering iron. So I'm kind of holding it in place with my fingers here so that it's flush against the circuit board. And I'm just going to hit it real quick with the soldering iron, Care being careful not to bridge the two sides. And that's all it takes. You can see on the other side the solder actually flowed to create a nice fillet. And then you can go ahead and trim off the excess with some side cutters. Ooh. <laughs> the reason why I have two extra pads here is if in case you have any peripheries like LEDs or I don't know a video transmission module that takes 12 volts you have two extra pads to solder to conveniently placed there. To assemble the XT30 power connector, uh, I usually have these alligator clip clips, same things, and uh, let me just put some stuff on there, some flux, and I'm preheating the iron to 350 degrees Celsius. I'm just gonna get a little blob just so I can like tack it in place. Let that solder flow, and now it's in place. And then I can solder like normal. Oh yeah, it's feisty. And you can just fill that mother jammer right up. That's messy, but that's okay. Okay, so that's now attached. Okay, I cleaned it up with some isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush. Now the negative side, or the positive side, which is the flat portion of the XT60, XT30, is going to be on the left and it's facing downward, when it's facing downward. And so that means I want the wires to be pointing that direction. I have two 50 millimeter length 26 gauge wires that are going to attach to this. So I'm just going to add a little bit more uh, liquid flux to both the wires and the connector. We're still at 350C and I'm just going to fuse that all together. God, I'm shaking all over the place. This is not my best moment. This is filmed way after the fact <laughs> in the future. Okay, that looks pretty good. So if you're gonna be using the XT30 mount instead of the JST PH 2.0 mount, then you want to actually tin these two uh, through holes and uh, attack it from the top, because this is actually going to be the side not touching the PCB, and that's where you're gonna to wanna to put your wires. 
Okay, so I got the XT30 mount here with the 50 millimeter length 26 gauge wires. Um, let's make sure to get the polarity right and add plenty of liquid flux to make sure this flows well. And let's go for it. So, and the wires are going to be facing um, kind of favored in this direction. And that will help the, uh, the guiding of the wires as it's installed. Okay, the power port assembly is complete. Um, I am choosing to use the XT30 connector instead of the JST. They are kind of mutually exclusive. The cage cannot accommodate both at the same time. So uh, make sure to clean this surface with isopropyl alcohol and then get some uh, double-sided tape and cut a little 45 degree angle triangle. Cut a little bit more than you think you need and then you can uh, stick that right on there. And uh, let's see. These scissors are black because they're Teflon, nonstick. So that helps a little bit. Let's just be careful not to cut any wires. And now it's perfectly flush. Now that we got the power port soldered up, the first thing I want to place on the PCB is the Bluetooth module. So first, um, if you look at it, how it's going to situate itself, we're going to place it right there. Okay? And we have two points of contact here and then a third along here. The two little inductors, we're going to use those with uh, double-sided mounting tape. So just take a little square of that and stick it on that little guy. And let's do another. And maybe you should take more care to make the squares as large as possible for the best sticking strength, but uh, Okay, so the little stickies are prepared. Now I'm going to use a hot glue gun and run a bead of hot glue right along there and quickly place the Bluetooth module. Okay, and just uh, keep your fingers on that. Hold it for like 30 seconds. Okay, and if you want, you can add a little extra hot glue on the top for some reinforcement. So this is what it should look like, and let's hold off on connecting this FPC cable until after we mount the PCB to the cage because this cable will get in the way of this screw. Next, let's do the power port, and the way this is situated is on the same side, of the, same side as the Bluetooth module, um, and then the fan goes here. The non-labeled side of the fan, you want that to be facing away from the PCB as shown. Get a Q-tip with some isopropyl alcohol and just lightly wipe down the areas that we're going to be using. Okay, and peel off this uh, double-sided sticky tape backing. And you can orient it like so. And then stick it right on the left side of this uh, PCB cut out and yeah make sure it's not touching any components and just apply some even pressure for about 30 seconds or so okay that's stuck on there pretty good uh, next now that the power port is attached let's install this uh, slim stack Pico easy mate slim stack connector and you just align it with the socket and then press down with a fingernail. Be sure never to apply any bending stress to the PCB as you're pushing down. Just make sure to apply even pressure. 
The two dangly bits are the fan and the XT30 if you're choosing to go this route and we'll install that when we mount the PCB to the bottom plate. And just as a reminder, this, these two wires on the right side, these are ground. These two wires on the left side, this is 12 volts in. So pay special note to that. Make sure all of your wiring is going to be correct. Okay, before installing the top buttons onto the PCB of the camera, um, it's easier to do this soldering job uh, beforehand. So uh, I want you to just tin these pads. Always use flux um, to reduce the temperature and the time on which you need to apply the soldering iron because the flux helps it flow better at a lower temperature. Okay, and yeah, so these two on the right are the record pads. There's two of them because uh, some people like remote recording via the flight controller, via their radio. And then these ones on the left are the on-off pads. Okay, that's it. And take the time to clean it with a toothbrush and isopropyl alcohol. We're going to be using double-sided sticky tape to mount the top buttons to the PCB below. And um, so get your very high bond double-sided sticky tape or whatever you have, scotch mounting tape. And let's cut a, uh, a square of it that is roughly the same size as the stiffener portion of the top buttons. Flexible circuit. And I'm just going to eyeball this. Okay, uh, that looks pretty close. Yeah, I've been doing this a couple times. And stick that right on there. And just, uh, you can use a fingernail to like apply pressure and concentrated pressure without applying much force overall to the circuit in order to be more gentle. Okay, and um, if you're looking at this and you see these screws and you don't have those yet, that's okay. I'm doing things a little out of order due to design changes of the cage design. So all steps will be covered when I get to them. But you may see elements that you don't have on your cage yet. That's totally okay. I will tell you how to do that. Okay, so peel that junk off and uh, here's a tricky part. To do this, what you want to do is first install the FFC connectors without touching the double-sided sticky tape to the PCB so that you ensure um, proper alignment before the adhesive is stuck on semi-permanently. Okay, so both of those are in there. Now I can press down and now I can lock these down, these latches. Don't forget to do this or else it won't work. And then you can apply even pressure um, for about 30 seconds. And we're gonna install these two mechanical switches for on off and recording uh, after we mount the PCB to the bottom plate. Okay, for the next component, we're going to attach the LCD extension to the PCB. And let's prepare both of these surfaces by wiping down this large stiffener on the uh, extension assembly and let's also wipe down this area on the PCB. Next once again I'm going to cut a uh, piece of double-sided mounting tape roughly the same size as the stiffener on the LCD extension. Okay I'm going to stick that on there now. I'm going to line it with uh, the front edge. Okay. Next we're going to install this thing by first aligning it with the, uh, see on the bottom here, this is a Molex 64-pin um, connector. We're going to align that with the, the male plug on the PCB first. And let's snap that in place. Okay, once that's down, then you can press down on the connector in order to uh, make sure it's fully adhered. Okay, now this guy is stuck right down there. 
the last periphery that we need to install to the uh, main camera PCB is the sensor ribbon cable and you take the short end and plug it in on straight here and uh, make sure it's well aligned and then press down should, should be an audible click make sure that's on all the way and we're gonna actually take this and bend it softly try to get a good gradual bending radius as you are slowly pinching this because this end is going to come up and attach to the sensor plate of the lens. Okay, so we got a subtle bend on there. It doesn't have to be bent all the way, just enough to get it started. Now that we got the periphery is attached to the PCB of the camera, let's move on to preparing the cage for accepting this guy. And to do this, first let's start with the fun part. Um, what we're going to do is these little 3D printed washers they stick right in here. They're little gap fillers, they're space fillers. And uh, the purpose of these is so that they can fit these beta gels. Um, but the reason why I just don't have it full thickness carbon fiber is because I want to be able to use alpha gels or give you the option to use alpha gels if you wish. Alpha gels require much thinner uh, plate material. Uh, but with my beta gels, uh, it's a much thicker um, uh, sandwich, I guess. And you can see here it's a little tight, so I'm just going to take some pliers to uh, really jam it in there. Or you can use the back of a screwdriver to uh, press it on in. Okay, all the little pockets are filled with the PLA printed 3D um, washers. Next, to install these uh, beta gels, what you got to do is remove the aluminum sleeve from the inside. That makes it easier to work your way into the hole, just like a flight controller gummy. So um, just kind of squeeze it and work it in there. And then once it's in there, you can reinstall the aluminum spacer, and that is never going anywhere. Next for the bottom plate, let's install the uh, fan grommet. Uh, the orientation does matter. If you feel around, you'll feel there's a ledge on the inside of it. You want that ledge to be facing on the, the bottom side because the fan is going to come in from the top. Okay, and then the uh, orientation of the bottom plate does matter. So have the bottom plate oriented like so. This is the correct. <laughs> so just do what I do. And then make sure the ledge on the uh, gasket is on the bottom. And then just force this thing down into that cutout. You'll have to bend it a little bit. And, uh, okay. All right. And just inspect the uh, ridges or the grooves such that it's fully seated. Next we gotta install these 20 millimeter standoffs and they there are six of these um, in all six and three hole locations and you want to use a M3 six millimeter button head screw and definitely apply Loctite to these guys and so remember this is the top of the bottom plate so we're gonna insert these screws in from the bottom because these standoffs are going to be facing topwardly. And so just get them hand tight and install all six of them and then later we're going to tight tighten them all the way. Okay, these are installed but they're not yet tightened. And the way I tighten them is I um, hold the screw on one side then I get some uh, wire strippers which have this curved tip to them. Grab hold the standoff and then tighten with the screwdriver from the bottom. And just repeat this for all six standoffs. Sorry, I can't count. There's eight standoffs. <laughs> the Pigeon version one had only six standoffs, so that's why I got confused. The next thing we'll be doing is preparing the soft mounts for the PCB. These screws go through these gold plated holes, and they have silicone on either side to give the PCB some cushioning. First, let's prepare the silicone tubing, 
Now you want to slice them to be about nine millimeters in length and you want six of them. Next we want six of these short segments of tubing at five millimeters. Okay, voila! Next install the five millimeter shorter pieces onto each of the two millimeter or M2 by 20 millimeter screws. Okay, now we got our six soft mount screws. The next thing is to install these onto the main PCB of the camera. To do that, place one of these screws through the top of one of the gold plated holes and then secure the screw using a nine millimeter section of silicone tubing. And just be real careful for this. Don't be tempted to use pliers or anything like that. Just use your fingers. Only soft stuff should be touching the PCB. Okay, now that you got your soft mounting M2 screws installed, uh, we can now mount this to the bottom plate and make sure the bottom plate is oriented like this. Uh, so first you want to install the CPU fan and this is a little uh, finagly but you can do it. Um, it's just a press fit. The fan just uses friction inside the grommet and so make sure to press on the edges of the fan not on the center hub because you can break the tiny little um, three spokes that hold the motor in the center. So just press in all around on all four corners, only pressing on the outer frame of the camera or, or of the fan. Okay, that's uh, good. Now we can take the uh, XT30 and then shove it into this hole. Um, Actually, maybe you should test that out first, make sure it fits. If it doesn't fit, you may have to do a little bit of filing, but it should be a pretty snug fit, and that just slides in there. And then the wires fold nicely inward. And then uh, scoot the uh, PCB around a little bit until you can get all the holes aligned with the M2 screws. And then you can flip it over and inspect to see that these screws are poking through all the holes correctly. Okay, and then take your, uh, what is this, 1.5 millimeter hex driver, brace it against one of the screws, take an M2 nylock nut, and screw that in there. You don't have to do it all the way, just enough to hold it in place. And then let's do the opposite side, so we can make sure all the screws get aligned. And it may come misaligned again, that's okay. You can just jiggle it around, jiggle it around, until it fits again. Um, I'm having trouble picking up this M2 nut. Okay, and then, yeah, brace it in place. So, get those nuts installed. Okay, now that the nuts are all installed, they're not tightened yet, so you gotta tighten them. I use like a four box hex nut driver thing, and I'm gonna tighten it until I see uh, a little bit of the screw poking out of the bottom of the nylock nut like that. And another visual tell is uh, this um, heat shield or this stainless steel sheet metal part, it should just barely not be touching the uh, bottom cage. M maybe there's like a millimeter of clearance. So in fact I feel like I'm a little too close so I'm gonna back out the nut just a little bit so it's more flush with the bottom of the screw. And just go around and repeat the same process for all six of these M2 screws. Okay, um, make sure to visually inspect for uh, clearance between any elements of the PCB and the carbon fiber bottom plate. And then you can also like grab it by a, a firm location and test if the uh, soft mounting is actually working. And it looks like we got some nice jiggle action. 
Next, let's finish mounting the XT30 uh, connector. So take a M2.5. This is a 2.5, uh, 8 millimeter length screw. And uh, actually, maybe you should prepare a 2.5 millimeter nylock nut uh, beforehand. And I don't know if this is hard to do even off camera, but I'm sure I am struggling a little bit here. Okay. Okay. Hold that in place and then screw it in. Just be very careful not to uh, damage the PCB of the camera. Whew. So we got that in place there. Let's do the other one. I'm going to stage this M3 screw right here and then grab the other M2.5 nylock nut and screw that in. Okay, and now let's screw it in for real. Uh, so hold it in place with the pliers. The pliers. Alright, and you can tighten these down all the way. Also make sure there's a little bit of clearance between this screw and the power port. Even if it does touch, it's not going to be touching anything metallic and cause a short or anything like that. But uh, yeah, just make sure it's not touching so that the uh, the damping of the PCB isn't going to be affected. Now that we got the PCB finally installed to the bottom cage, we can take the Bluetooth ribbon cable and kind of uh, <laughs> untangle this mess here and uh, lift up that latch on the connector, if it isn't already, and guide this little cable in there. It may take some finagling because that screw is a little bit in the way. Nothing we can do about it, unfortunately. Okay, there we go. I think it's in there. And then close that latch down. So it's always going to just sit a little funky like that, but it's okay. Okay, we're done with this part. Let's set this aside and get to work on the top cage. Now we're going to uh, fix up the top cage. And let's mount all of these cage brackets to it. First, uh, push the screw through the TPU, then apply your Loctite afterwards. Make sure to drop it like that. And uh, there we go. And a little dabby dab. And then put that on there. Put, put it on there so that the straight side, the flat side, is facing inward. And tighten that down until it's uh, nice and sturdy and snug, but don't over tighten it because you're you're screwing up your screen against TPU, so it's not going to be like carbon fiber. All right, let's repeat the same process for the three other cage mounts. For these smaller brackets, we want to have them facing inward as well. Go and find the two 8mm uh, length M3 screws that are in your kit and uh, use these for the slot struts. There we go. And uh, make sure they're oriented so that the curve is facing downward. So it's concave down for all those uh, mathematicians. And this one, you don't want to tighten up too much because it's got to be able to move. But on the other hand, it doesn't want to, you don't want it so loose that it's loose and sloppy. Like you don't want any play. It's got to be silky and firm. <laughs> okay, almost done with the top plate. The next thing we have to do is uh, install the battery straps. It's good to do this now so that you don't risk damaging the PCB uh, doing it after it's been installed. Um, but if you forget to do this, you can easily take the top cage off and fold it off to the side and then install them. It's just a little bit safer this way and easier. And take note, um, 
There are chamfers on these slots built in. They may be small sometimes, depending on the uh, tolerance of the machining, but they are there, so they're not gonna cut into the battery straps. Okay, um, next up is the lens mount. It'll be easier to first install these standoffs onto the front plate before we actually install the uh, 3D print with all the bits of lens inside. So for the front plate side, we want to have the standoffs be semi-permanently secured. So that means getting out the Loctite. And the orientation matters. Um, screw it on such that the standoffs are facing like so. Okay, now that we have all four of our 20 millimeter standoffs installed in this direction, let's go ahead and tighten them down using the same method I showed you before. Okay, this is ready to go and ready for the lens mount for when we do that. Hopefully at this point now, you've kept all of these parts safe and you haven't gotten any fingerprints on your IR filter yet. Um, what you want to do now is install this little guy. You want to position it so that the uh, smaller diameter side goes inward from the top. So just kind of plop that in there and then use your microfiber towel, what do you call it, and uh, work your way in. So it's kind of at an angle so it got jammed so you can God damn it. Okay, trying that again. Um, plop that in there and position it with the microfiber cloth and press down on the rim. Don't press down on the center glass because you could risk breaking it. And just work your way around. It's a little bit of a tighter fit inside of my lens mount than it is for the original camera, but it will go in. Don't you worry. And the rim is made out of metal, so it's pretty strong. Um, I want to loosely install the metal ring, which goes on the top of the lens mount. And let's see here. Get that position so that it's lined up with the holes underneath. And then we're going to be using the double zero uh, Phillips head driver to get these screws in there. These small screws are the original ones that came with the camera, so make sure you And don't tighten it down all the way. If you see it kind of jump up on the other side like that, back it off. And then let's tackle it from the other side now. Okay, I bottomed out. Let's back it up. A few turns. Okay, so this should still be loose. And the reason why is because we want clearance. We want clearance for uh, this little guy. So this slot in the bottom is meant to carry the ribbon cable through. So position that ribbon cable through that slot without touching the IR filter. And then push it in, kind of press down and align the two straight edges with each other. Now this part right here tends to get hung up a little bit, so you kind of got to press that inward and maybe even use a, uh, a screwdriver, like a hex driver, to push that down as you push this down and just apply even force all around. Make sure it's well seated. Okay, now, now let's um, take the remaining screws and just loosely install them for the bottom half. Now this last screw can be a bit difficult. Um, at least it's well aligned though. You can see that the hole is directly concentric with the, uh, the cutout in the PCB. So first uh, position your screw on your driver. And 
it has a tendency to flop around and fall out. So hold the lens so that the IR filter is above so that if it does fall, it's not going to hit the IR filter and scratch it. And let's try to get that in there. Twisting. Shit. Come on. Okay, just when you barely get it in there, take a break <laughs> and then repurchase, find a better grip on it so it's nice and stable and finish it off. In this one you can tighten all the way, just don't over tighten because it's a very thin circuit board. And confirm that this little switch is actually able to move. You want that to be able to spring back up after the lens has been installed. Let's finish tightening up these four screws. Just slowly work your way around, sort of like changing the tire on a car. And do a visual inspection to make everything is uh, seated and flush. You don't want anything to be misaligned or just jammed in there. Everything should fit quite perfectly. Now as a demonstration, I want to show you what you do if you accidentally um, touch the sensor and get your grubby fingerprints on it. Or sorry, not the sensor, but the IR filter. So I touched it with my finger and I'm going to try to clean it. What you do is get some lens cleaning solution or um, deionized water or like distilled water and spray down the tip of a Q-tip. You're gonna want a whole bunch of these because depending on how greasy you got the lens, it's gonna take successive um, wipings with the Q-tip. Now take the Q-tip after it's been saturated with the fluid and wipe most of it off on a microfiber towel. Then do very small circles on the lens and these little blobs of moisture for the first time around they're going to remain because you have the most amount of solution but as you go along twist the q-tip gently so that you're unveiling a clean surface okay and we're just scrubbing away but not applying very much pressure at all to the, to the glass. Now let's get the other side, the clean side, spray it once again, maybe with not quite as much, and then wipe or dry it on the microfiber cloth, and then go at it again. This time we're gonna be absorbing some of that moisture that we put down with the other side of the Q-tip. And notice how the uh, the little blobs of moisture are going away because right now we're, we're applying moisture as you can see but it's evaporating pretty quickly that's what we want and once you got make sure you've covered all the area find a dry spot on the q-tip and do one last lap around the circumference and make sure to go through the center as well Yeah, that's looking pretty okay. And if you notice like a slight cloudiness to it, um, that just means you got to do more trips with the Q-tip. Get another another clean one and follow the same process and until the very end where you're doing it with a dry Q-tip. And all you're doing is pretty much um, wiping up any residual uh, solution or dissolved salts or greases on the lens. So that's looking pretty clean. Next, let's prepare the sensor plate for installation. To do that, we have to remove the original sensor ribbon cable using the number zero Phillips driver. Treat this part with as, with, with as much care as you did the main PCB because if you 
screw anything up here, your camera's not going to work too. Now you can have an opportunity to see the sensor. So the original sensor ribbon cable has this little tab. You can just use your fingernail to gently uh, pry it up. Okay, so that's done. Double check the sensor that there's nothing on there, no grease, no dust, or anything like that. It's looking pretty clean to me. In fact, I'm not even going to use my squeeze bulb. Make sure you've got a nice, clean, dust-free surface to place your sensor plate downward. And uh, next, install some of the shims. Now this, you're going to go back later and really dial this in. But for now, just throw all of the stiff um, shims on here, just the non-annoying ones, because there's some really thin ones that are really unwieldy. You're probably going to end up using them later, but just for now, just to get the, the whole assembly together, just throw um, the stiff um, shims in there. And then you can take your sensor plate and make sure your back end is nice and dry. <laughs> I just realized how that sounded. Okay, and there's this rubber um, curtain, or like, yeah, curtain or gasket that surrounds the sensor plate, and that kind of hugs this groove, this rectangular groove around the lens mount. So just place that down. In addition, the uh, locating pins for the shims will go through the PCB of the sensor plate. Okay, so that's pretty well seated in there. We're going to be using these three long screws that came with the camera, and you can just put them in there and get them started by hand. And these are number zero Phillips drivers, or Phillips screws, and my screws, my driver is way too magnetic. Come on. There we go. And don't really worry about tightening them down all the way because we're only going to be opening it up again when we do our shim calibration. Also, don't worry about installing this ribbon cable yet because we're going to have to undo it anyway. All right, it's time to install the rest of the stuff. Um, do that. <laughs> uh, place the whole lens assembly inside the front plate. And it can rotate, which is fine. And place the spring into that little hole. Okay, it's a little misaligned. So get some tweezers and make sure that's standing straight up. Then install the button, and the button should restrict the rotation a little bit. Next, put in the uh, plastic space filler, as I call it, and make sure that's seated all the way. Okay, and then we can install the ring spring, Bruce ring spring, Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> okay. Um, and you can locate it, uh, the little holes of the ring spring on the locating pins that are printed into the 3D mount, 3D printed mount. Then once you have that, you can make sure that's real centered. Then place the stainless steel ring around it, the ring around the rosy. And now you want to kind of caress it with your whole hand to make sure everything is in place. Also check that the button is still able to move. And then hopefully your uh, stain <laughs> hopefully your stainless steel screws are nearby and your 1.5 millimeter hex driver. Get these started with your fingers or something. Don't try to attempt it right away with the hex driver because you may stab your lens mount right in the face. Okay, you can go, and go on to the next one. Don't try to do them all. Don't try to tighten it down all the way. 
Get it started with your fingers and finish the job with the tool. And then um, loosen it up a little bit because we want the ring to still be able to slide around because uh, we're going to do a final positioning at the end. Okay, so it's mostly on there, but see how it wiggles around? That's what you want so that you can position it so that there's ample clearance between the button and the carbon fiber. So try to get that as centered as much as possible. Okay, and then tighten it down the rest of the way. And let's make sure that's dusted off and then you can install your uh, lens cap to make sure it's clean on the inside. Just double check to make sure the button is still nice and smooth. We need to install the lens brackets. These lens brackets have two sides. The side that's smooth and has the chamfer, that's the side that we want to insert the uh, M3 heat inserts. Warm up the soldering iron to 350 degrees Celsius and then put the insert on the tip and then real quickly press that in there but be very gentle. Only use the soldering iron to um, let it go in and then push it slightly below the surface so that when it backs out it's nice and flush. For the back side there's going to be a little bit of flash left over so you can take that and pull it right out and it makes a nice clean look to it. So let's repeat that for the uh, um, other three brackets. Okay, these little guys are done. So go around and just push these lens brackets that we made earlier such that the, uh, I don't know, the flower edge is uh, facing outward. Okay, and you want to arrange them so that they're in this orientation. Next, let's go in there with the 10 millimeter button head screw and apply some Loctite and smooth that out so it's not super globby such that you don't get as much on the TPU. And you could have attached the hinge before um, installing the sensor ribbon cable. That method would have worked as well. Okay, let's tighten these up to our liking. And similar to the slot struts, you want it to be smooth and silky, but no slop. It's time for the switches. Okay, so prepare each switch with 50 millimeters length of 26 gauge wire. All wires are black because the order does not matter in which you solder these. I put a little bit of heat shrink on the nubby nubs for extra short protection. This is what their cord button normally looks like, but I cut the tabs a little bit short to provide more clearance before soldering the wires. So what you got to do is uh, make sure the ends are already tinned of your wires, and then have your soldering iron preheat to 350 Celsius, and then uh, Solder each wire to each pad and use a minimum amount of heat possible but at the same time make sure the, the joint is good and flux really makes an improvement of these joints. Okay now for the record button you want to install that on the record pads. That was terrible. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Okay, 
You get a nasty looking solder joint like that. Touch it up with some flux. Add a little bit of extra solder to your iron. And try it again. My hands are shaking so bad because of various reasons. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, there we go. And then clean that up with like a screwdriver or something to knock off all that extra flux. And then get a toothbrush with uh, isopropyl alcohol to get rid of that residue. This extra set of record pads is for if you want to wire it up to your flight controller for remote recording. Okay, we are ready to mount the top to the rest of it. Uh, before, make sure to remove all nuts and washers from both of these mechanical switches. Okay, and then make sure the sensor ribbon cable is attached to the sensor plate of the camera. And what you can do is, um, um, this may be a little out of order, sorry. <laughs> First inspect both of these connectors to make sure they're clean of any debris. And you can uh, align it and then press it down just like that. So that's connected. We're good there. So let's poke that through. And I'm just twist twisting it at a diagonal in order to fit it through that rectangular slot. And then now that's through. You just gotta line it up with the, uh, the socket on the sensor assembly. Also, be sure to clean both of these connectors with a toothbrush and isopropyl alcohol and then dry it out with one of these squeeze bulbs just to make sure there's no dust or particulates that are going to interfere with the signal connection. Okay, so get that nicely lined up and then maybe even brace one of your fingernails against the sensor plate, the PCB, so you don't put undue stress on it as you're pushing down. And sometimes it clicks, sometimes it doesn't. This one I have unplugged and replugged several times, so it doesn't click this time, but it doesn't matter. It's still a secure fit. Okay, so that looks good to go. Next, we can swing the top plate over. And then what I'm gonna do is uh, first install the uh, on off switch and I have it so that these two wires are further outward from the camera so it doesn't touch the uh, top plate as much and then I'm going to take the record switch and also place it through its hole which is further forward okay and I'm going to put the top plate down a little bit to provide a little bit more clearance and then I'm going to guide these wires such that there's the least amount of overlap of wires. You can do a dry fitting of these uh, switches to make sure that the wires are routed as good as they can without crushing or bending the top buttons uh, flex too much. It's okay if this bends. I mean, that's why it's flex. So that's okay, but if you can minimize that, uh, that's even better. So now that the switches are roughly in place, I'm going to just tack this thing down um, using M3 by 6 millimeter button head screws. You do not need Loctite on these as you occasionally need to service your camera or clean it, whatever. Uh, so I do not put Loctite on. Okay, now that that's like, you know, roughly one piece, we can install the washers and the nuts. Let's start with the on off switch. Um, it comes with one of these anti-slip washer, spring washers. You can use that. And then uh, you only need one of these hex washers. The switch assembly comes with two, but you only need one. And you want all the washers and the nuts to be on the top portion because if you have them on the bottom, it's going to create uh, too much intrusion of space on the interior of the cage. Okay, so... Um, the hex size for this nut is actually serendipitously uh, the same as a prop tool. So you can hold this just with your fingers in place. It might help to move the uh, lens out of the way so you can use the prop tool easier. 
and you have to press down a little bit because the switch actually touches the inside of the prop tool but uh, you might have to hold the body of the switch with uh, some pliers if you can't get a tight grip and then uh, tighten down you'll know when it's done that's good right there and uh, flip the switch make sure nothing's loose or shaking that seems pretty solid now for the uh, record switch it's got a, um, a cut spring washer so install that and then the hex nut here is a little bit bigger unfortunately we cannot use a prop tool um, so yeah thread that on there mine's a little difficult because I cut my wire length for the, for the record switch to 50 millimeters so um, I have less slack to work with but you should have cut yours to 60 millimeters instead okay so tighten that as much as you can with your fingertips and then we're going to be using two pairs of pliers you can use one pair of pliers to uh, rotate it and adjust the position and then hold it in place and then use some other needle nose pliers to tighten this screw down okay feels like it's hitting the bottom just one last little tightening and that should be good and uh, test both switches make sure that's nice and good now we can install the rest of these uh, six millimeter button head screws and there are eight in total and tighten them down not such like they need to be bomb proof but just enough that you know they're not going to come loose okay if you notice here the spring washer on the on off switch is actually touching the button screw preventing me from tightening it all the way so what I'm going to do is uh, unscrew it a little bit and then I'm going to just poke this so it's more to the left to give myself a little bit more clearance and then I can screw this down all the way and then retighten the uh, on off switch okay continuing on Sam from the future here, uh, go ahead and remove this back plate um, until we finish the sensor shim calibration process. Uh, but the reason why is because this plate is made out of carbon fiber and when you're leaving the uh, lens communication ribbon loose like that, it can actually make contact with the carbon fiber as you can see just like that, which could potentially cause a short. So just take this and remove it. and set it aside until everything is ready to go and this is installed into its appropriate connector. Okay, we are still nowhere near finished. <laughs> uh, remember this guy, the LCD? Yeah, we gotta, we gotta fix that up. <clears throat> so, um, start with the 3D print. Align it so that uh, the screen should be facing you like this and then the buttons should be like that. So make sure the windows are aligned and then use the uh, yeah the little hardware bag for the screen is right here and let's see I believe these plastic screws no they use a 1.5 millimeter hex so use these self-tapping um, plastic screws in order to attach the front part of the uh, LCD buttons. Okay, and be careful with these screws. Make sure you don't tighten them too much because you can strip the plastic. Next, let's install these 10 millimeter standoffs. And for these, I don't really bother with using Loctite. 
uh, because it's not going to be vibrating like crazy, like a drone would be. But I do tighten down the standoffs using my usual method for the uh, front plate side. Um, we need to use some double-sided mounting tape, cut little strips, and lay them out all around the perimeter. Make sure all of these are stuck down pretty securely and we can go at it with the tweezers to peel off the backing. Now that's done, let's install the LCD. Okay, so this is the direction that the LCD goes. And we can use these standoffs as kind of guides. And really, the hard part is going to be just making sure the, the vertical alignment is even between the two sides. So uh, let's give it a shot. OK, and we can see there's now contact between the LCD and the carbon fiber. And I'm just gently going around making sure that it's well stuck. All right, it's button time. Plop these little rubber things in. Make sure the alignment is correct. Like that, so that on the front, it looks like this. And then place the button things on. And there's locating pins, which help you Make sure it gets aligned. Okay, flip that over. Make sure that the buttons spring back fully and uh, you can press them and there's no, they're not getting hung up or anything. Okay, next is a pretty satisfying part. We're gonna install the monitor extension now. So for the monitor extension, um, be sure to clean it off with some isopropyl alcohol, specifically these portions. These components right here, um, they, except the ribbon cable portions and sometimes during the manufacturing process some flux residue can cause the latches to become stiff so we want to make sure everything is loosened up and if there's any debris or solder balls or flux residue stuck on the contacts we want to make sure that we uh, remove that so um, don't be shy with the amount of isopropyl alcohol you use Make sure to really drench it because we want to work loose anything that's caught in there so we have a good electrical contact because we only want to do this once. Okay, let that dry for a while and um, maybe use a heat gun to evaporate all of the isopropyl alcohol. All right, this is a pretty fun part. Um, yeah, lift that flap, put it over the top. And then first insert, insert this J plug thing. Okay, something to note with this particular connector. Um, I think it's something to do with the uh, connector that I'm sourcing for this particular component. But for some reason, um, for my connectors, there's slightly more resistance in order to insert this flexible PCB. So if you see any little gap you see that little gap between the top of the the top of the connector and that little I don't know what to call this thing this little ledge if this is not all the way down you're gonna get a black screen so just get in there with some tweezers and push down all the way you want to make it so it's uh, absolutely flush 
and just apply a little bit of pressure, make sure it's in there all the way so that it's nice and flush. These little tabs should be down all the way. So it might take a little extra force and uh, that's why I had you clean the uh, connectors with a toothbrush. This toothbrush looks gigantic um, with some isopropyl alcohol in order to make it so it goes in easier. So once you're confident that these tabs are all the way situated nice and square up against the connector, then you can throw that latch down and you have a nice good solid connection. Okay, and let's repeat that for the other plugs. And for this one, I always use these tweezers. Now that all the connectors are secured, this next bit is subtle but important. Um, we're going to tape the monitor extension to the back of the LCD. Um, I have capped on tape, but you can use electrical tape just as well. I use capped on because it's used exactly for this purpose and also it tends to stick a bit longer. Um, so here's the trick. You want to make sure that the connector is sitting above that ledge, okay? You don't want it up here or else when you assemble the LCD case, it's gonna squish the back of the LCD. So you wanna place the connector slightly above it. Something that I recommend doing just for electrical purposes is, uh, see this um, shielding or the outer stainless steel housing for the connector is connected to electrical ground and um, we don't want it to connect or touch the back of the LCD, which is stainless steel. And so for that reason, I recommend putting a piece of electrical tape um, on the LCD. And let's see if I can gently work that on there without making a complete mess. Okay, that was okay. And then you can get some tweezers or something to uh, press that on there. Just gonna work it on, and this adds a little bit of an insulating barrier. Um, it will still work if this connector touches the back of the screen. I've never had any issues, but other users have reported issues with that. So for that reason, I recommend play, applying a little piece of electrical tape right here, and that should solve any issues. Okay, so with that in mind, um, position the top connector here on that ledge, you can feel it with your finger, and make sure the uh, monitor extension assembly is uh, aligned. And then you can apply your tape to stick that down. And really make sure this tape is on there. Um, you don't want it peeling off because it does add structural support for this whole thing. Okay, another piece of tape for the other side. And um, for this one, you want to have it favoring the bottom side, or in this case, the right side, uh, because this connector is going to be lifted up a little bit in order to make contact with the other side of the case. So really work that adhesive, make sure it's on there super good. Let's wipe off the back of the stiffener of the LCD to provide a nice clean surface for some uh, double-sided mounting tape. And then you can also clean the, um, the side of the carbon that is going to be coming into contact with the mounting tape. For adhering the uh, stiffener to the back of the carbon fiber here, we're going to be using um, some double-sided tape. If you have some of this Scotch VHB tape. It's called a very high bond. Um, they come in various numbers. But anyway, the difference between this stuff and your typical wall mounting tape is uh, the thickness. So notice how the VHB on the right is thinner than the, uh, on the extreme mounting tape on the left. If you have this stuff, I would use this 
for mounting the back of the monitor extension. Um, the reason why is because it adds a little bit more clearance between the connector and the back of the LCD. Bob, go get some mountain tape. <laughs> That'd be a great brand name, mountain tape. Okay, uh, then cut a rectangle of mounting tape that is roughly the same size as the stiffener. So now apply your double-sided mounting tape, double-sided mountain tape, <laughs> uh, to the stiffener and align it with the left edge, as you see on camera. You can use your fingernail to apply concentrated pressure um, to make sure the adhesive is sticking to all parts. When you think that's secure, then you can get some uh, fine tip tweezers to peel off that backing. There we go, got it. And next we can replace the um, back cover. So it should not be touching the adhesive or the, the double-sided mounting tape when you put it flush like that on top of it. And that's when you know that your connector is situated correctly and it's not going to crush the LCD. Okay, let's throw those screws on there. So the double-sided mountain tape is not touching the back of the LCD and um, we need to help it out. Using this 2.5 millimeter hex driver, this Allen key, we can hook it from behind, get behind there and then underneath, and then use that to apply some pressure upward. And the trick here is uh, you might expect, you might encounter some resistance, especially on the left side from wanting to push upward. And the reason why is because as you're pushing this stiffener upward, you're shortening the length of this, the rest of it. And by shortening the length, it's causing the back of the connector to press up against the metal backing of the LCD. So you might just have to help it out a little bit. Just push up on the left side of the connector and then go back in there and make sure it makes contact all the way on both sides. You can hold it there for like 30 seconds to make sure that the uh, double-sided tape is fully bonded to both sides. Uh, here's a pro tip. If you ever find yourself needing to disassemble your LCD for whatever reason and you've already stuck on the adhesive, the double-sided tape, I get a, uh, a nine inch propeller and I just like work my way across it like this. Just be very gentle. Uh, don't put any stress on the monitor extension. Don't try to peel it all, all off in one go. Do it slowly like this until you get deeper and deeper and you're just scraping away the double-sided tape until it finally comes loose. You gotta be real patient with it. And then once you think you've got most of it off, then you can um, start prying it downward. And you can see there's still a little bit more back in there, pretty deep. So I'm just gonna do a sawtooth action. And I think I got it. Just holding the connector down. There we go. And then removing the gunk without um, putting too much stress on the cable, you can put some pressure on the back of it, but not so much pressure that you crack the screen. And then you can just like roll it off, sort of like a booger. Just imagine you're picking your nose and you want to get as large of a booger as possible without leaving anything behind because you're going to feel it inside of your nose later. So try to get that booger off in one gigantic glob so that you can flit it, flick it at the back of your uh, classmate's head. Okay, next let's do the uh, jumper cable. These black covers, I keep these on there for the next couple of processes to make sure the plugs stay nice and clean. Now, um, this bit is confusing. I have four strips of EMI shielding tape. You will only have two because I only have thin strips, but you're gonna be receiving one inch 
full length strips, full width strips. So take the ones that are slightly shorter. Um, I cut these to a precise length, so you don't have to do that yourself. And peel off the uh, adhesive backing. And for the shorter ones, we're gonna be, or the shorter one in your case, um, install it so it's flush against the edge of one side and then slowly lay it down um, so that it's nice and a consistent right on the edge. And then for yours, you're gonna have some hanging over, left over on the other side, and you're gonna trim the excess. Okay, let's do the other side. For the this side of the jumper cable, you can apply the tape so that the edge is right below that silk screen number, J2 or J1. And align it so one edge, one side is right on the edge. And try to line that up as best as you can. Oops, I totally botched that. Luckily the adhesive isn't ridiculously strong, so you can undo it if you mess up. Okay, so pin that in place with one fingernail on one side and then do it the rest of the way. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that. Okay, so the, uh, the overhanging edges, you wanna have them aligned so that they're um, kissing each other. And take your fingernail, just make sure it's well bonded. Okay, now you can take some scissors and go at it from the top side and just trim off the excess. It's pretty easy to cut. And you don't have to worry too much about cutting into the PCB because there is a little bit of a margin of error. Um, this this uh, waffle pattern here is ground plane, so if you cut into it and there's still ground running through it, it's still okay. This shielding tape, it actually serves a function. Um, without it, the signal quality decreases, and this is especially important because um, this is a long way for the LCD signal to travel. So this will help maintain the integrity of the uh, connection. Sam from the future here, before gluing these TPU housings onto the ends of the jumper cable, make sure to write the words CAM and LCD on the uh, EMI shielding tape so that you can see from the outer surface which direction the cable should go. Now, it's not a big deal. Actually, this cable is reversible. You can plug it in to the monitor both this way and this way. But if you plug it in the wrong way, when you touch the screen, there's some lines that show up and some interference. So just write this down so you know to attach the LCD side to the LCD. And that way you're not gonna get any weird uh, lines on the screen every time you touch a button or touch the touch screen. Next, we're gonna make this into a professional looking product. Um, using some type of epoxy, I recommend this plastic bonder by JB Weld. It, uh, the resin is black when fully mixed, so it matches this well. Also, because it's plastic bonder, it's going to be able to stick both to the metal and the plastics of the circuit and the TPU covers. Um, I like to use a mixing stick by cutting off a Q-tip at an angle like that. Provides a nice little scoopy surface. And then I just got this sacrificial um, surface here and I'm going to spit out a little bit of epoxy. I don't think this is epoxy actually, it's something else, but it's similar. And if you don't have this or you can't find it, that's okay. Uh, regular epoxy, two-part epoxy will work. But I do recommend some kind of two-part adhesive because usually it's a lot stronger. And let's mix that up. I recommend one with a uh, at least a 15 minute cure time. If you do something with five minutes, that's not enough time for this project.
Okay, next I want you to pretend like you're in a bagel shop in New York, Noah's Bagels, and using your best smearing technique, smear on using the uh, diagonal cut edge of the Q-tip, a nice thin consistent layer of glue onto the each of the TPU housings. And be sure to get up onto the edges, like get a little bit of a glue schmear right up onto the edge. And I put a little bit of extra glue into the pockets of these uh, um, top half of the housings because uh, that's going to be making contact with the structural components of the connector. Okay, that's looking great. Next, um, we have to apply or press together the two halves. I have these special clamps that I made. I 3D printed some grippy grips, but I'm sure you can jury rig something up yourself, like use books or something. Um, so you can position the stiffener directly over the cutout of the bottom connector, the bottom housing, just like that. And then plop this guy right on top. Okay, it's probably best to keep a rag around so you can wipe off your hands so you don't make more of a mess than you need to. And that's why I put that TPU cover on because that blob of glue right there could have gotten into the plug. And then using that bit of Q-tip that I cut off from the beginning, I can use that to wipe off any excess residue or glue that is seeping out of the sides. Okay, now we're gonna mount this thing to your pigeon or your puffin. First, it's a good idea to get a toothbrush with isopropyl alcohol just to clean the bottom and tops of these bushings in order to get rid of any dust. And the reason why is because the silicone will actually stick to the carbon fiber washers and it makes it a bit more convenient when removing and installing the cage. Okay, set that aside on its side so you don't redust the bushings. And then get carbon fiber washers. You're going to need four for the bottom layer. Place those down, and then we can easily slide the cage. Just align the holes and slide it down on top. Then place the remaining four carbon fiber washers on top. And finally, we can use these M3 knurled thumb nuts to screw it down. And uh, they're just meant to be put on using your fingers. And keep on screwing it down until you finally hear it, finally feel it bottoming out against the aluminum sleeve on the inside of the beta gels. So let's do that again. Okay, and repeat that for the remaining two um, bushings. Okay, and you can inspect the beta gels to make sure you got the full amount of squish going on, and these look good to me. And you can also check that your power cable coming from your regulator reaches your um, XT30 just fine. And uh, definitely check um, your voltages, your polarity and values coming from your regulator before you attempt to power the camera. Before plugging in our naked black magic, we need to confirm this is a good 12 volts. So let's plug in our drone, preferably with a smoke stopper in line, in series. And 
let's get our 12 volts. Okay, so that's positive 12 volts. So that means the red is in fact positive and the black is in fact negative. So if I were to plug this into here, that means the black is on the right and the red is on the left. And remembering back to our power point, this is facing this direction with respect to the rest of the cage. And so if we look at that, let's see if that's correct. Negative should be on the right and positive should be on the left, which it is, so we should be good to go. After verifying that uh, our voltage is the correct value and polarity, we can plug in the JST PH 2.0 connector. I just use a fingernail and I also brace it from the back side holding on to an exposed rigid portion of the PCB and I just use a fingernail to push it in all the way. Now that all the components are together we can go ahead and begin the sensor shim calibration process. But first let's just power it up and see what happens. So make sure the camera is switched off which is the forward position on the slider switch. And then you can plug in your drone, preferably with a smoke stopper, in case there is a short, there's a better chance that your camera will survive if you have a smoke stopper, for sure. So, power on your drone. The camera's still off, mind you. Now you want to power on the drone while the camera's off first, just in case the, cam the drone does something crazy, like it flips out. Because you do not want to have your screen attached and your face right above your drone while that's happening. <laughs> so then you can take your um, monitor, plug in the uh, plug in this this end. Make sure whichever end you wrote LCD is connected to the LCD side, and then plug in the camera side into the camera. And then you can hit the slider switch back. Okay, so we got a screen and uh, just confirm that the touch screen works and that you're able to do everything here and it looks like it's all good. For the sensor shim calibration I have the back plate removed and I have uh, my favorite lens on here having it pointed at a distant object out the window in this case it's one of the apartments across the courtyard you want to have something that's sufficiently far away uh, like an infinity point what you want to do is set your aperture to as low of a number as possible in order to have the shallowest depth of field to get the most accurate calibration. Okay, I'm going to uh, make sure the camera switch is off, then power up the drone. Okay, plugging in the LCD. Let's turn on the camera. Okay, so we have an image. To make uh, things easier for this, first go into monitor and then turn on focus assist. This is focus peaking. This will allow us to see what is in focus and what is not. The second thing you can do is press the magnifying glass button and that will crop in a little bit. Now I'm going to, you're going to not see this, but I'm going to adjust the focal ring on my lens. and. Right now I am going to close focus, so this is like 0.12 meters, 0.2 meters, 0.5 meters, and this is infinity at the very end. So pay attention to that window out in the distance. You see how the focus point is going in and out? So the actual focus point is right here, but when I go all the way to infinity, it overshoots it. So what's happening here is as I go um, to infinity, so moving out to infinity, you can see the rear lens element is getting closer to the sensor. So going toward infinity, the lens is moving closer. And we were overshooting, so that means the lens is actually sitting a little too close to the sensor. And what we need to do is add a little shim in order to move it slightly far away so that when we get to infinity, it lands right on that sweet spot. Now in the opposite case, if we never reached a focus at infinity at all, let's say we pushed it all the way to infinity, but it never got in focus for distant objects. 
In that case, it would mean that we would need to remove shims in order to make the lens become closer to the sensor. But in our case, we were reaching infinity at about there, and we want it to be there. So that means the lens needs to be moved further away a little bit. Now the shims that come with your camera, it's kind of a crapshoot as far as what you'll get. The shims that I have currently installed are the number 0.5 and 0.3. That, these numbers represent thickness in millimeters. So right now I have 0.8 millimeters thickness worth of shims in the camera already. And we need to add shims in order to get that sweet spot. So the shims that I have here are 0 0.025 and 0.1. I have a feeling that 0 0.025 is not going to be enough, so I'm going to add the 0.1. All right, I'm going to remove the sensor plate. Okay, I have my 0.1 millimeter shim ready to go and position it in the correct orientation. And what you want to do is just gently work off this gasket and then kind of take your fingernail and make sure the shims stay on the lens mount and they don't come with the sensor plate. Um, come on. There we go. Okay. So then I can take my shim, place it on the locating pins. Those locating pins make a huge difference toward making this process easier. That's why they're there. And then close it back up. As you close it back up, it does tend to like push the shims away somehow. I don't know how, but you kind of got to just finagle it in there. And if it's not going in, then something's not aligned properly. So you got to try again. See this shim got stuck on my finger. So if you have fat fingers, it makes this very difficult. And I don't. <laughs> okay. Trying again. So it's getting hung up on something, I don't know what. I think it's these, uh, they're falling out from the bottom. So I'm just taking a screwdriver and pushing them back up. And now it's aligned. I felt it go in. Okay, so that's a little trick. If they slip out from the bottom, which they do tend to do, you can use a tool to push them back up. Okay, let's bottom out this screw just so we can hold everything in place and it doesn't come flopping out. Okay, go around and check to make sure every screw is at the bottom, but not like completely tight. Just snug. Okay, let's see if I can turn up the screen brightness for you. Is this possible? There we go. Now you should be able to see more easily. Okay, so um, everything is out of focus, and there. Oh, magic, right on the dot. So listen, oops, there we go. Now the lens is fully seated. So right when I hit infinity, the very end, that little click there, it aligns with the far window coming into focus. So we were right on the dot. We got lucky this time. Let's say, for instance, we did not get so lucky. Um, let's say we had a 0 0.025 shim and a 0 0.1 millimeter shim, but we needed to land somewhere within the 0 0.05 millimeter range. Uh, the reason why I have some Kapton tape stuck to my fingers is because Kapton tape, at least the one that I have, um, is about 0 0.05 millimeters. Um, the calibration is a little bit off, but it's about 0 0.05 millimeters. So what you can do is just modify one of these shims and place a bit of Kapton tape right near 
um, the holes where it connects to the sensor ribbon plate. And what this will do is just thicken the shim just a little bit in order to create a shimming of your shims. So shimmy shim shim shimmy shimmy shim shim. <laughs> Here's your shims for your shims. Now that we know that we have the proper amount of shims in the sensor plate, we can just go ahead and tighten up those screws just one last little bit, make sure they're secure. And then we can reinstall the uh, lens communication ribbon cable. So we have to lift this latch up and stuff this cable in. You may have to use tweezers for this. And just confirm that it's all the way seated by using a fingernail against that stiffener. And then put that latch down. It should be good. Now we can finally replace the back plate. Let's swing those slot struts back into position and screw these thumb screws back in. Woohoo! <laughs> and notice at uh, both 45 degrees and negative 30 degrees, the sensor ribbon cable is not going to run into any issues as far as bend radius or pinching. Now that the sensor shim calibration is complete, we can, as a final step, christen this drone by throwing on some Uma Grip. Don't mind the hot glue stains. <laughs> Get a clean pair of scissors, you can clean them off with isopropyl alcohol. That will make cutting this stuff a lot easier. And cut about five millimeters down the length of one of the long sides. Now this will be the perfect size to fit on the top cage. Okay, opening up the battery straps to make way for the good stuff. Okay, let's just see how close our fit is first. Okay, that looks good to me. And we can peel off the backing. And let's get it nice and well aligned. And now for everybody's favorite part. Oh yeah. It's very nice. <laughs> And finally, we can now suit it up so it's ready to go for your next amazing shoot. You've done it. You've completed the cage build for the pigeon or the puffin. Wow, okay, that was a lot to go through, but uh, take pride in the fact that you probably did one of the most difficult builds in all of FPV. So, congratulations. Now you can go out and uh, rip this thing around. No, first you want to do is fly your drone without this camera on board, just with the battery on top, find some squishy foam or something, mount the battery on top, fly your drone, make sure it's not going to do a flyaway. As long as you get a good tune with the drone itself, even without the camera, um, it's going to fly pretty well with the camera. You might have to do some minor adjusting after you um, start putting on the payload, but the payload dynamics of the pigeon or the puffin is designed such that there's minimal um, camera payload oscillation, so that's not really a huge factor, especially if you're reducing your filters to improve performance and reduce latency in the PID controller loop. Yeah. <laughs> okay, have fun out there.